Kicking off our list at number 10, Israel Cursed Tomb. Here we go, right off the hop. A secret tomb was discovered in Israel only a month ago. Now this is the first time a tomb has been found at the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 65 years. Now the actual cave itself was discovered only a year ago, but these smaller chambers are being found recently, as like a month ago recently. And the tomb found came along with a message. Awesome, we love those. It vows to curse anybody who would open the grave, and this message is also written in blood red, so yeah. Can we not open this one, maybe? Last time we had a black sarcophagus in Egypt, people were sticking their heads in for no reason, just to see what's up. And then, you know, a plague happened, so. Number nine, Polish King Curse. Some of you may remember this, or your parents might so ask them about this at dinner. Yeah, make it weird tonight. Ask them about a Polish king curse tonight while you're eating food. Back in 1973, a team of archeologists were jazzed when they uncovered an ancient 15th century tomb. The tomb of the Polish king of the time, King Casimir IV Jagiellon. Now media was of course all over this discovery, as they should be, it was exciting. Now everyone was of course making jokes about a curse. You kinda have to, right? We're all thinking about it. What if there's a curse? I don't know. Open it though, still. Some team members involved ended up dying after the discovery. It was a little odd. There were a few who said it was due to a curse, but the sudden illnesses were in fact caused by deadly fungi inside the tomb. So it still was the tomb's fault, but it wasn't a curse per se. It was breathed in, and that's what led to these researchers' untimely death. Number eight, King Tut's curse. Here we go. Since we're on the topic of illnesses or curses, let's go back 50 more years, shall we? To the legendary discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. This discovery is what made everyone, you know, so paranoid when that Polish king curse came out, right? This discovery and what followed is the main reason we believe in mummy curses today. One member of the expedition, George Herbert, passed away suddenly six weeks after they opened King Tut's chamber. It was not toxic mold, it wasn't a curse, but rather it was a mosquito bite on the cheek. He got blood poisoning from a mosquito bite, that's all it was. I mean, I'm sure digging up bodies from the past and opening the tombs up doesn't help karma in general, but it wasn't a curse written in red. Not this time. Number seven, a strange resting place. Ancient burial grounds, okay, these tombs, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Some can be these massive great pyramids, and others can be a shallow cave system. Sometimes there's ancient history right below your feet, and you'd never know. In St. Augustine, for example, the remains of a donkey were found buried underground. And judging from the skull and the bones and the placement, something was afoot here. It had clearly been hunted down by humans and placed there purposefully. That's not the mysterious part at all. The mysterious part is that all the bones have been carefully separated and there's no marks to suggest that any tools were used. So researchers believe that this thing wasn't even used for food. So what was it? The limbs were placed to point north and south. That's it, they used this donkey as a compass. How rude is that, what? Donkeys in that area of Florida in the 17th century, that's not bizarre at all. But the way the bones were buried, you know, north and south, that's very odd. That's very Game of Thronesy. you know what I'm saying? What's the message here? What's the point? What's the point? Besides north and south, of course. Number six, tortoise tomb. Okay, somebody called Mario. We got a lot of shells to explain, okay, pal? Back in 2005 in northern Israel, a tomb of a shaman, who we believe was a 45-year-old woman at the time of her passing, was found in a cave. It was a cave slash tomb. Like I said, many different shapes and sizes. There were 28 other skeletons as well, and it appears they had a six-stage burial. There were beautiful decorations to suggest such, but something that really stood out here were the you know, 86 tortoise bodies discovered in the corner of the tomb. What was, what was going on here? What did we miss? I have FOMO, but I'm not sure why. Was this an ancient feast or a long lost sacrifice? Either way, poor guys. Number five, the sitting man. Okay, of all the tombs to find, this one would be the most horrifying. This would be so jarring to stumble across, okay? Buckle up. Back in 2005, researchers found a Mayan tomb in Honduras from the fifth century, okay? It's a long time ago. And the body inside was not lying down. It wasn't a pile of bones pointing east or west this time. Rather, it was in a chair, sitting up, like a villain from Zelda. How scary would that be? I mean, it's beautiful, but that's jarring to stumble across. You know what I mean? Whoever was the first person to look and see that, Brave soul, that's all I'm saying. The body found, it appears to be an elite member of the Mayan Empire. He passed away, we think around 650 AD. Yeah, the guy gets propped up in a chair, that's awesome. His legs were crossed and he was rocking jade jewelry. This was very royal. And the tomb itself was actually upright as well. It's common fear to be buried alive, but in this case, you'd have plenty of room. You'd be like, oh, 
we're good. These types of tombs are actually quite rare to find, but the fact that this one is also in great condition and there's somebody sitting cross-legged inside, double rare. Here we go. Number four, message from Egyptian afterlife. We're all curious what happens after you die, of course, but nobody celebrated the end of your days like ancient Egyptians did, right? It's beautiful. Like I've mentioned before on this channel, they would have these fake painted doors. They would leave valuables. Any new tomb that we discover provides more hints as to what lies beyond, right? An ancient necropolis was discovered only a few years ago, again, in Egypt. It contains dozens of coffins and a necklace that holds a message from the afterlife. Okay, now we're talking. This site is around 2,000 years old and they're in the process of excavating it as we speak, slash as I mansplained to you about these tombs. But so far the tombs and artifacts found, officials think, belong to an ancient priestess. A message from the afterlife is pretty spectacular, but what does it say exactly? Well, we're still waiting to find out. These things take time, you know? Number three, the Terracotta Army. This is, I mean, talk about curses, oh boy. The tomb of Emperor Qixi Huang, China's first emperor, okay? In this tomb, we can find 8,000 statues. This one is quite loaded. I almost made this number one just out of principle. But they all have unique carvings on their face, as if to suggest these are all custom statues, all representing an individual from that long ago. All 8,000 of them. The emperor believed that after he had passed away, he would have the spirits of his enemies to face, so he wanted to be prepared even after death. The emperor decided to close the tomb before the workers even had a chance to get out. It was horrible. He was worried his enemies had found out. So there's of course lots of statues down there and a lot of dark history, just all piled into one. I would never go near this. I think the mummy three is about this tomb. It didn't do so well, but yeah, scary concept. Number two, mythical carvings. Back in 2014, a 1700 year old cemetery was discovered along the Silk Road, which are these ancient trade routes, ancient highways rather, connecting China and the Roman Empire. Now in the city of Kucha, now in Northwest China, the cemetery was found along with 10 ancient tombs, one of which was referred to as M3. M3 didn't have any haunting messages this time around, but it did contain several carvings of mythical creatures. Creatures that were once alive? Question mark. There's the white tiger of the west, the black turtle of the north, the vermilion bird of the south, so far so lovely, and then there's the azure dragon of the east. A little bigger, a little bit more mighty. These mythical carvings represent different seasons and the heavens, but could the other six carvings mean depictions of hell? Probably, possibly. And finally, number one, the ring of Sekinianus. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family. Don't touch this. This is why you don't steal from ancient tombs. Has to be number one. This 12 gram gold ring, for starters, looks beautiful. And secondly, it's massive. Its diameter was 25 millimeters. So unless you were wearing some sort of infinity gauntlet, she's probably gonna fall off your little Jack Skellington fingers, you know what I mean? The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, a village west of London known for its grim history, because in 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site. And come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned and probably pretty cursed. The ring was mighty and even had an inscription on it, a Latin inscription, of course. It read, Senecian vivas in diem. And when 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced, rather. The data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, in a place called Lydney. That's where this ring is from. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting, and how his favorite ring, got stolen. Hmm, I'm connecting some stories here. Uh-oh, I may have stolen something I shouldn't have. If this rings a bell, yes, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this exact legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. Yeah, let's get that ring back ASAP Rocky. That would be great. I'll be a lot quicker than Lord of the Rings. I'll be a lot quicker than three movies. I'll tell you that. Where's this temple? I'll put it in my Uber right now. I'm on my way. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archeologists but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go, we're good. 
False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes, so that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now, a lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go. But in 2014, archeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. Tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty. And it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to know here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher, who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so 
the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort gone into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers next will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Enkimor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found. So when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the Pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, AKA the Lady of Grace, AKA Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16 year old Akhenaten. She worshiped the sun god Aten and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana and she also created a new religion. So how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealthy wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself 
himself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want to fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight. Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After radar tests were Conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number six, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered, a totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in German's hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though, is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're onto something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing 
the same direction. Tomb KV62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close, let's just Give me a shovel, I'll get in there, I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Starting our list off at number 10, New Grange. Heading over to the beautiful Ireland, kicking off this list. New Grange is this massive circular tomb. It's an ancient mound, really, protruding from the earth. It's quite hard to miss. Now the tomb is roughly five 5,200 years old, meaning that this passage tomb in the Boyne Valley is older than Stonehenge and older than the Great Pyramids of Giza. That's pretty incredible. Stone Age farmers built this mound somehow and is 85 meters in diameter and 13 meters high. Again, Quite massive, hard to miss. A tomb that takes up an acre of space, must be nice. Now the passage and main chamber just happen to align with the rising sun on the mornings around the winter solstice. And if that's not fancy enough for you, the tomb is surrounded in a ring of large curbstones. There's actually 97 curbstones that surround Newgrange in total. And some of these are engraved with megalithic art. And probably one that says Todd was here, most likely. Number nine, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, of course, as you guessed, in the Valley of the Kings, but the name of the tomb is a number. What in the Elon Musk is happening? Who names their tomb a number? What? KV52, that's the official name, and it was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV50, KV51, and of course this one, KV52, they all together form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Hidden underneath six feet of debris this entire time, the entrance to KV52 was finally found. So when we enter a tomb that had been untouched ideally for thousands of years, we could find anything, right? In fact, whatever they do find is a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle of humans' history. So when officials opened KV52 and it was pretty much empty, yeah, that's, that doesn't feel too nice. All this time, really, it's empty? There's no treasure, are we sure? Empty except for two boxes, both black and undecorated which is a little ominous. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments. Number eight, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago quite often when we refer to these tombs and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time. But in 2014, archeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. It was tucked away in Luxor, Egypt this whole time. We've missed it for so long. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty. Now, it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official of some sorts because Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt at the time and given how this tomb looked when we found it, 
yeah, they were pretty important. Officials believe that the tomb could have been used as a mass grave due to the large amounts of human remains found inside. Now, it's important to note that this tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that time, which was way later on, was found in the same tomb. Yeah, we're gonna find a spork in that tomb in 5,000 years and be like, oh yes, more ancient tools. Number seven, ancient curse. When officials found the tomb of Ankhmahor, AKA a pharaoh official from 4,000 years ago, they also happened to find a curse. Yeah, for real, this one was written on the wall right there. That's how you know that you're screwed. Buried in Mastaba, an above ground massive tomb held this warning. It reads, might do against this my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. And it also warns of Ankhmohor's knowledge of secret spells and magic. And it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. So if you enter this tomb, you magic, you might see some ghosts. I don't know, I'd be out of there comedically fast. You would read that and then look down and my shoes would be left there, that's it. I would be gone, my shoes would be left. Like a cartoon. Number six. Celtic Warrior Shield. Now this one was referred to as the most important British Celtic art object of the millennium. So yeah, not a bad title, I guess. That's pretty cool. An ancient Iron Age chariot burial was discovered in Yorkshire a few years ago. And our researchers were actually excavating a house development in Pocklington. They didn't mean to find this, but then all of a sudden they find a soldier's tomb and they're like, all right, I guess that's lunch. Are we rich? I don't know. The soldier was laid on a chariot. It was beautiful, but he had a Celtic shield laid over top. Now this shield was also dated back to 175 BC. A lot of history, lots to unpack here in an accidental tomb finding. First of all, most Iron Age shields up until this point didn't have a scalloped edge, but for some reason, this one here did. We thought metal shields were only used for ceremony, but this one's been used in combat. It's been repaired and then used again, it seems. There are clear sword marks around the shield, each that tell a story. Yeah, let's just go poke around a Celtic warrior's tomb. What could possibly go wrong? Sure. Number five, the sitting man. Back in 2005, researchers found a Mayan tomb in Honduras dating to around 650 AD. And the body was not lying down. It was actually sitting upright in a chair. Yeah, again, I would run out of that tomb comedically fast. This man was an elite member of the Mayan empire, it seemed. He had passed away around 650 AD and his legs were crossed and he was rocking jade jewelry. It was a beautiful setup. The tomb had also been positioned upright, like I said, and these types of tombs, they're quite rare to find. Mind. But the fact that this one also had somebody occupying it, still sitting up, still cross-legged with their jewelry, that's beautiful, it's double rare. Usually people come in and grave rob, this is lovely. Would you ever walk into a tomb? Sound off below, this is a terrifying job. We have home funerals today that are kind of similar to this. I saw a post recently on Reddit where a guy, instead of an open casket, he was just sitting on the couch with his clothes on, like dead, as if he was still alive. And that's an interesting way to do a funeral. I don't know, it's kind of like ancient Egyptian, kind of terrifying. I don't know how I feel about it. Number four, Paris catacombs. Of course we have to mention these ones, so haunting. Have you seen As Above, So Below? Yeah, I'm never visiting this place. These catacombs date back to the late 1700s and they're literally full of bones. So it's no surprise that some entrances and compartments have been blocked off, ideally, hopefully, forever. The catacombs history is pretty twisted, it's pretty sick. When the city cemeteries were filling up, and I mean that in a literal sense, officials began moving bodies all over the city, just trying to spread them out, just off the roads, ideally, maybe, and hopefully, to these abandoned mines. Eventually, those started filling up, and now we don't know what to do. But the catacombs did open in 1809, so, eh, you know what? What a fun family excursion we have now. Let's go see the whole maze of bones. All these bodies that were occupying the land, they just stacked them up. Now it's a tourist attraction. I feel sick to my stomach. They designed the catacombs with the walls of skulls to ensure that visitors would meditate on the idea of death. Lovely, let's go home, I'm terrified. Number three, Poland double tomb. All right, here we go, two in one, time to get cozy. All around the world, there have been a handful of two-person tombs discovered. Now, this is the only one that they found in Poland, so pretty impressive, have to mention it. Back in 2015, archeologists discovered this 2,000-year-old necropolis that had been sitting there for centuries, just at peace. And then we came along with flashlights. Now we gotta open things up and lick rocks to see what year dates back to what and whose skull is whose, right? Whatever geologists do. Lo and behold, they were around 120 tombs in total. Yep, now they're all awake. Awesome, here you go. Enjoy your resting, we're here now. Now you're a museum. They were used from the first century AD to the third AD. Now among these 120 tombs were two, one, a two and one, that stood out. 
tombs that archaeologists referred to as princely. Pre-war culture in Kujawi were in fact Celtic, so their burial process was also Celtic. Now, it's a little odd to see a Stone Age Celtic necropolis in Poland, so yeah, it's like history, it just collapsed into one little ball, and then we found that ball, and we're like, oh, what's in here? A lot of spiders, and let's get rich. Number two, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. It was a six foot tall slab of pink granite and it was carved over 3,500 years ago. The door was found near Karnak, the door was found near a Karnak temple in Luxor, and it originally belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hepshiput many, many moons ago. Now, Uzer was a high-ranking official for over 20 years, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead, so that's why they're all over here. The actual slab of granite, though, this door, it was found originally far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later, and somehow it ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Yeah, never thought I'd have to say this, people, but don't steal doors from the dead. That guy for sure got cursed. Okay. And finally, number one, the Alexandria Black Tomb. Speaking of uh, curses, this one's pretty heavy. We found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria back in 2018. You probably remember this, right? And somebody thought it was a good idea poof, to open it up. And it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. It was bones and sludge, and it smelled so bad, everyone ran away. It was horrific. When archaeologists found this massive tomb, again, untouched for over 2,000 years, on one hand, sure, that's a great find. It's a fascinating discovery. Lovely, it's a feat in itself. But us humans, we're curious cats, right? We want to pop it open, see who or what is inside. What if it's Alexander the Great? What if it's treasure that they used to pay off everybody's student loans? Hey, who knows, right? Let's open it up. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted just a few centimeters before every official involved at the construction site fled the scene. Yeah, it smelled that bad. They had to run away. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this man put his entire head in the tomb later on to show us that it is safe and not cursed. I mean, you can use your hand, you know what I mean? You can do this, you don't have to pull your head in, you can just do the one hand thing, that works just as well. Maybe a foot, but straight to head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, watch the mummy, don't do this. Do you think this released a curse upon the world? Again, this was 2018, so... I don't know, who knows? Sound off in the comments down below all your thoughts and concerns. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the knife-armed man. In 2018, while researchers were excavating a 1,200 to 1,400 year old necropolis in northern Italy, they made a gruesome discovery that led to us learning a super interesting story of someone who lived all those years ago. Inside this necropolis, there were the remains of a man, but what set him apart from the others is that he had a knife blade prosthetic arm. Further analysis of his bones showed that his arm had been removed via blunt force trauma. Normally, all those years ago, the wounds would have killed you. If not from the loss of blood, then from infection because, of course, this was a time before antibiotics, but somehow this man managed to survive it all. And in doing that, he made himself the scariest prosthetic limb I've ever heard of. He replaced his missing hand with a long knife buckled to his arm with leather straps. In our number 9 spot today, we have KV55. This is a tomb that is referred to by a number rather than a name because we don't actually know who lies inside of this tomb. While this tomb had its modern discovery in 1907, we still haven't quite found the answers surrounding this mystery. To make things a little more eerie, while the walls of the actual tomb are bare, which is bizarre, as you walk down the steps towards the tomb, you'll notice there are some markings leading up to it. You'll see inscribed on the wall of the entrance the words which can be translated to, the evil one shall not live again. If this wasn't enough to give an unsettling feeling, the coffin inside of the tomb has been desecrated, with part of the face having been removed. So all in all, we don't know a lot about what's going on down there, but it doesn't seem good. In our number 8 spot today, we have Man E. Okay, so normally when you're out in the field searching for mummies and tombs and all of that sort of archaeological business in Egypt, the containers or vessels that the past people are put in are decorated or contain some sort of drawings or writings. So in 1886, when Gaston Maspero, who was the head of Egyptian antiquities, came across a plain burial box, he was a little intrigued as to what could be inside. 
This box had no information as to who the person inside may or may not be, but the corpse inside was wrapped in sheepskin, which was apparently considered unclean by the ancient Egyptians. When unwrapped, it was revealed that this person had both their hands and their feet bound, and as he looked towards the face of this person, he found what appeared to be a screaming face looking back at him. Back in 1886, we didn't have the same amount of information as we do now, so of course this quickly freaked researchers out and led to everyone believing that this person must have been tortured to death. How scary that must have been. But luckily, with the things we now know, we have a much less horrific answer, thankfully. If the jaw of a person isn't strapped shut, when a body is mummified, the jaw naturally falls open, thus this horrible screaming expression. The real mystery that remains is how this mummy, who clearly wasn't considered a person of royalty, came to be buried alongside kings and queens. In our number seven spot today, we have the black granite sarcophagus. In 2018, archaeologists in Egypt found a massive black granite sarcophagus in Alexandria, Egypt, that dated all the way back to 2000 years ago. Rumors immediately started swirling about what this sarcophagus might have contained, but the best way to find out? Well, you have to open it, of course. Instead of some crazy curse being unleashed, the first thing that escaped this tomb when opened was a horrible, unbearable smell. Apparently it was so bad that the site had to be evacuated for a while before they could return to finish opening it up. When they finally were able to completely lift the lid, they found a red brown like sewage water flooding the bottom, which is likely where that horrible smell was coming from. Other than all that gross stuff, inside the sarcophagus were the bones of three people. Unfortunately, the mummies did not end up being well preserved, so only the skeletal remains were still intact. It is believed that the people inside may have been soldiers from the time of pharaohs. This is believed because one of the skulls had a crack in it from an arrow. There was a bust found along with the tomb, but unfortunately due to time past, it has been weathered beyond recognition, but that is not the only way researchers can find out where the soldiers are from and what time period they lived in. In our number six spot today, we have the Inca mummies. In 1976, researchers found two mummies at a burial site in northern Chile. These two corpses belonged to two young women who were the victims of human ritual sacrifice. It is likely that the sacrifice they were a part of was one that was carried out by the Inca to commemorate either historical or political events, or as a response to a natural disaster. The mummies were found wearing silver ornaments, and they were surrounded by ceramic vessels, and they were wearing red robes. The red in the Inca clothing was often created using hematite or other iron oxides, but upon further inspection of these mummies, it was revealed that their red clothing held something much more dangerous. The dye used for their clothing contained cinnabar, which is a mineral rich in mercury. This was often used in the ancient world as a pigment for makeup, clothing, and painting, but handling it leads to mercury poisoning. What is strange is that researchers believe that the toxicity of cinnabar wasn't known in ancient Peru, so we aren't exactly sure why they used it in the first place, but it's thought it might have been used as protection against grave robbers. In our number five spot today, we have the Faliron Delta Necropolis. In 2016, during the construction of a new library and opera house in Athens, crews accidentally stumbled upon this necropolis, which is a cemetery that is the final resting place of more than 1,500 citizens from ancient Greece. And while this is most definitely an eerie discovery and a reminder of our own morality, the horrifying discovery came when they found a small chamber within this one, and inside there were more than 80 skeletons that all had their hands shackled above their heads. How's that for a horrifying discovery? I don't know, I'm gonna say pretty good. Each of these skeletons belonged to people who died young and healthy, and while the exact cause of death is yet to be determined, all signs are pointing to some kind of mass execution. Right now, the best theory as to who these people may have been is that they may be some of the people who were a part of a coup in 632 BC that was led by Cylon against Athens. It's just strange that even after these people passed, they didn't unshackle them, but that might just be a mystery destined to stay a secret. In our number four spot today, we have the Ancient Curse. All right, so of course we have to have a good old fashioned curse that was unleashed from inside of a tomb. Okay, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but there really was a curse found on the inside of a tomb. This tomb was the tomb of a pharaoh's official who was thought to have lived around 4,000 years ago during Egypt's sixth dynasty. It was an above ground tomb that was shaped like a rectangular box. Inside of the tomb, they found a curse inscribed that warned anyone who dared to disturb it. 
The curse, roughly translated, states anything a trespasser, quote, might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It then goes on to warn the trespasser of his knowledge of spells and secret magic, and it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. These kinds of curses have been found in other tombs, and while they certainly are nothing like the ones depicted in horror movies about mummies, it might still be a little unnerving to those unearthing this discovery. In our number three spot today, we have the Lothagam North Pillar Site. One of the most incredible archaeological finds in Kenya led to a... Well, it wasn't exactly a horrifying discovery, but it certainly was unexpected. Around 5,000 years ago, a tribe of herders paused by a lake in what is now Kenya in order to bury their dead. This ended up turning into one of the most massive and monumental construction projects Africa had ever seen, which is no easy feat. For 450 years, they dug into the bedrock, piled up slabs of sandstone, and buried their dead for generations with ritual ceremonies, and this led to what researchers now consider the earliest and largest monumental cemetery in Eastern Africa. Here's the one kind of unexpected thing that they found here at this site, though. Along with the bodies of those who had passed, researchers also found 405 gerbil teeth at the site. As it turns out, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this, and it's because they were used to make a headpiece for just one of those who had passed away. This site might not be as large and tall as some of the other monuments like the pyramids in Giza, but what makes them the most remarkable is that this site was made by the people for the people. Not for emperors or kings and queens, it was for tribe members of every age and gender buried alongside each other. In our number two spot today, we have the tomb of Hatshepsut. This was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, and she was the second historically confirmed female pharaoh. She was an incredibly interesting person who we really could talk about all day, but we are here talking about tombs, so let's cut to when hers was found and unearthed. There were a few interesting things found within her tomb, but the real horrors came after when they began to examine her remains. They were actually able to find a cause of death for her and can actually attribute it to something she possessed. They found benzoprene carcinogenic skin lotion with the pharaoh, and it is believed that this gave her bone cancer. It is likely that she poisoned herself accidentally while just trying to soothe her skin. Being diagnosed with something like that with the help of modern medicine is already a horrible and painful and scary thing. I couldn't even imagine having to go through it all these years ago without any kind of treatment. In our number one spot today, we have this ancient mystery. Okay, so this is one of the coolest things I've ever heard, and it has me rethinking my entire career. Maybe I do want to be an archaeologist after all. Basically, researchers have found a 1,300-year-old Chinese mystery, and where did they find it? In a Tomb Raider shaft. This feels like a Hollywood blockbuster, and somehow it's just real, ancient life. While excavating a tomb in China, the team discovered the skeleton of a young man that was riddled with wounds, giving clues as to how he died. The man is estimated to have been about 25 years old, and it is thought that he was harmed and then thrown into the Tomb Raider shaft while still alive, which is absolutely gruesome. It is believed this crime took place between 640 and 680 AD. It appears as though he wasn't a thief because the shaft had begun to be refilled with soil by the time of his death, so we really aren't sure why this young man met such a cruel fate. As a true crime enthusiast, this is absolutely fascinating, and I wish we could find some answers to bring this guy's story full circle. Sometimes, though, these things are just destined to stay a secret hidden in the past. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike. <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two, we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. 
Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives. Otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? <laughs> It's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint. Just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him, her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living in after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go, in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three, we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them, I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it, they're cute. They respected them, they worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat would just be like, no, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. 
hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them, and then however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crop, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child, and it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it, you guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff, and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Kicking off the list at number 10, new tombs. Fresh off the press, folks, Egypt announced only yesterday, <laughs> Egypt, they announced it, yeah, just all of them as a whole. Egypt announced only yesterday that they've discovered five ancient tombs in Saqqara. This is fresh news, this is brand new, only a few people know about this. These tombs date back to the time of the Old Kingdom, around 2700 to 2200 BC. So yeah, they're a touch old. The five tombs were found northeast of the Pyramid of Manir, a sixth dynasty structure. Now these tombs clearly belong to a group of people with high value. They were obviously officials. Mustafa al-Waziri, head of Egypt's Supreme Antiquities Council has since released additional information on who the tombs belong to. How fun is that? That's how fast we're getting to the bottom of this already. This happened like yesterday and we already know who's in the tombs? Okay, great work. The first one belonged to an ancient official named Iri. There's a deep burial shaft that leads down to a chamber filled with funerary decorations, offering tables, the seven oils. It looked completely untouched. Well, it was. And of course, there was also a limestone sarcophagus. Can't have a tomb without a sarcophagus or two. Number nine, Queen Nerit. Just over a year ago, the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities announced the discovery of Queen Nerit. 
the wife of one King Teddy. Yeah, here we go, AKA the first Pharaoh of Egypt's sixth dynasty. They found her burial shaft. There were coffins, of course, mummies, artifacts, all dating back to the new kingdom. Meaning the Saqqar necropolis was used in the late period, but now apparently it was also used in the new kingdom as well. That's the news to us. Perhaps the most questionable find was a four meter long scroll. That was the 17th chapter of the Book of the Dead. Yeah, nothing like finding a chapter of your favorite book. You're like, ah, where's the rest? Let's find them. It's like a national treasure movie, only haunting. As well as funerary masks, miniature boats, and 50 coffins. A lot of coffins in this one. Again, this is the first time 3,000 year old coffins were found in the Saqqara necropolis. This is huge. Number eight, mummified lion cub. Back in 2019, Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb was released, and honestly, what a weekend that was. That was a good time, I remember that one. If you haven't checked it out, I implore you to do so. Officials discovered a 4,400 year old tomb that belonged to a man named Wache at the Saqqara Necropolis. This was pretty close to Cairo, only 30 kilometers away, so you can only imagine this commute ages ago and how beautiful it must have been. This tomb was full of incredible artifacts, mummified animals even. There was a lion cub and over 3,000 ancient artifacts. A lot of stuff, jam packed this one. When digging up our past, it's tricky because you don't wanna ruin any funerary decorations and anything like that and be disrespectful, but you also wanna know who these people were. We wanna know about our history, what happened, what they stood for before their passing, and why they were so important in the first place. Wache and his family remains were studied and it appears malaria claimed the lives of him and his entire family. This is also the first mummified cub we've ever found in history, so as far as findings go, this one was uh, jam packed. Jam packed with history. Number seven, King Tut's artifacts. The new Grand Egyptian Museum was set to open in 2018, and then finally it did come 2021. And while that's quite recent, the contents displayed inside certainly are not. For the first time in history, King Tut's ancient belongings, all of them, all the artifacts discovered with him, will be on display. See, prior to this museum being open, we only saw around 150 artifacts from his tomb. They all took pieces on tour, a big Egyptian mummy tour, you know. It was like Kiss's final reunion tour, then also King Tut's. You're like, oh, who do I see? Ooh. But now this museum, this grand museum, will house thousands of artifacts. That's over 7,000 square meters as well, might I add. What a display this is. If you have a chance to visit the Grand Egyptian Museum, or if you saw this King Tut world tour, I'm jealous, I'm very jealous. We have one museum in Toronto, but it's, you know. The Egypt section there is number six. Necklace from Egyptian afterlife. We're all curious what happens after you die, right? But nobody celebrates the end of your days like the ancient Egyptians. They go hard, they really, they really go for it. Like I mentioned earlier, they would paint doors, leave valuables, any new tomb we discover has thousands of artifacts, hints rather, to what lies beyond. An ancient necropolis was discovered only a few years ago in, of course, Egypt, and it contains dozens of coffins and a necklace that holds a message from the afterlife. Okay, now we're talking. This site is around 2,000 years old and they're in the process of excavating it right now as we speak. But so far the tombs and artifacts found belong to an ancient priestess. Nice, a message from the afterlife is pretty spectacular. We want that, we want that. Don't let Rose from Titanic near that one or else you know what she'll do with the necklace. You know what she likes doing. Number five, engraved warnings. It's a part three, so of course we have to include some Paris catacomb creepiness. Yeah, as far as the old tombs go, that one's pretty haunting, I'd say, no? These catacombs date back to the late 1700s. Not so ancient, but give me a break, okay? It's part three, I'm doing my best. When the city cemeteries were starting to fill up, and I mean that in a literal sense, officials began moving contents from all over to these abandoned mines. The catacombs were open officially in 1809. What a fun family excursion that must have been. Nice. That or the wax museum. They're like, mm, let's take the kids this way. Let's go this way. They designed the catacombs with the walls of skulls to ensure that visitors would meditate on death. That's the whole vibe. We go, let's go meditate and think about death for a bit in the walls of skulls. Yeah, I'm sure everybody who visits thinks of nothing else. Pretty confident there. In order to ensure this was the vibe of the room, there's a phrase carved above the entrance and it translates to stop, this is the empire of the dead. I, I would be like, okay, no problem. Number four. Bone compass. Okay, just because we've been talking about graves does not mean these messages or anything have to be written or drawn. Sometimes it can be as simple as leaving animal bones on the ground. Yeah, that ought to speak for itself more than any art. If you see that, you're on your way. I'm not gonna be grave robbing if there's a big old pile of bones oddly placed 
What do you guys like, White Walkers, Game of Thrones? What is this? This is terrifying. In St. Augustine, for example, the remains of a donkey were found buried underground. Judging from the skull, it had been clearly hunted down by humans at the time. That's not the weird part here. The weird part is that all these bones have been carefully separated. There's no marks to suggest that any tools were used, so gross, for one. But researchers believe that this wasn't even used for food. The limbs were placed to point north and south. They use this donkey as a compass. How rude is that? Donkeys in the area of Florida in the 17th century, that's not bizarre at all. But the way these bones were laid out, something's afoot here. What's the message here? I mean, obviously besides that way's north. Is there any other message if that? Or are people just bored back in the day? Number three, mythical carvings. Back in 2014, a 17-year-old cemetery was discovered along the Silk Road, which are these ancient trout roads, ancient highways rather, connecting China and the Roman Empire. In the city of Kucha, now northwest China, this cemetery was found along with 10 ancient tombs, one of which was referred to as M3. All these tombs get their cool nicknames like KB55, that's pretty good. M3, short, sounds very British. M3, sounds like a British secret agent. M3 didn't have any haunting messages this time around, but it did contain several carvings of mythical creatures. Some creatures that don't even exist. There's a white tiger of the west, the black turtle of the north, the vermilion bird of the south, so far so recognizable, and then there's the azure dragon of the east. Could this mean that dragons are very real? Were very real? Are? I vote R, please be real. These mythical carvings represent different seasons and the heavens, but what could the other six carvings even mean? Maybe the depictions of hell? Number two, chalk drum. Deemed one of the most important pieces of prehistoric art, this chalk drum is 5,000 years old. It was first discovered by archeologists in England back in 2018. It was found with the remains of three humans. It was featured in the World of Stonehenge exhibition. It sounds like an instrument, but really this chalk drum was used as an art piece. Almost like all of our drum sets from when we grew up. I'm like, oh, we don't actually play that. It's just for show. Yeah, I can't do anything on it. That guitar too, can't play that, just for show. Maybe time of your life, if you're lucky, on a good day, but for the most part, for show. British Museum Project curator recalls the findings as remarkable, of course. This was the artistic language throughout the British Isles 5,000 years ago. Radiocarbon dates back to 2890 BC, around the same time of the construction of Stonehenge. So yeah, pretty old. A chalk ball and bone pin were also found at the site. So again, pretty loaded discovery. And finally, coming in at number one, Celtic warrior shield. This one was referred to as the most important British Celtic art object of the millennium, which not a bad title at all. An Iron Age chariot burial was discovered in Yorkshire a few years ago, and researchers were excavating a house development originally in Pocklington, and then they find a soldier's tomb. <laughs> nice. Also, what's the asking price? The soldier was laid on a chariot with a Celtic shield over top. The shield was dated back to 175 BC. See, most Iron Age shields up until this point didn't have scalloped edges, but this one did. Yeah, we thought metal shields were used only for ceremonies, but this one has been repaired. There are clear sword marks. It had been used many, many times in battles. My arm gets tired in class if I raise it for too long, you know? I have to like do the old switcheroo or like hold it up, one of these. This guy was holding a metal shield up all day long. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna go do a thousand push-ups now and fix that light that I moved when I did that hand bit. 